So we thought we would switch it up because uh, Niha has done such a fantastic job of putting it together that I'm actually going to present the case and she's going to educate you on pregnancy and fertility and safety of medication. Um, so I'll be here in case you need me. <laughs> I'll be right there. Um, so this is a 38-year-old Caucasian female who presents to the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Clinic. Her patient, her, uh, the patient and her partner have been trying to have a child for one year, uh, so she's concerned for infertility. And we'll just, for the purpose of this, this discussion, say she's been trying for 12 months with unprotected sex, who meets the true definition of the World Health Organization of infertility. Because one thing we always have to ask is, well, are you actually getting pregnant at the time, or trying at the time of ovulation? Just as a sidebar, I had one patient who came to me and said, I just can't get pregnant. And then we found out that her husband lives in San Francisco and she lives in New York, and that they're just not together at the time that she's ovulating. Literally, the first cycle he moved to New York, she became pregnant. So we said her solution is just you just need to actually be in the same city and ovulate when your husband is in town. So she didn't quite meet our definition of infertility, but that happens. So when you have patients who are asking, telling you they're actually having a problem, please remember to ask what exactly has been happening on a monthly basis. So uh, she was diagnosed with ileocolitis seven years prior. She had some arthralgias at the time. Uh, she had a colonoscopy three months prior, which actually showed normal mucosa. She uh, macroscopically but microscopically had some chronic change of crypt distortion, but no activity. Interestingly, not only has she had difficulty getting pregnant, she's actually had two miscarriages. She also has a history of anxiety. Her uh, treatment uh, was azathioprine, 150 daily. She also was receiving uh, anti-TNF with infliximab, five per kilo every six weeks. Uh, due to arthralgias, actually, she was converted from Q8 to Q6, uh, not because of the IBD, and she's had no disease flare on biologics. She previously had failed um, budesonide and mesalamine, um, and uh, also was steroid dependent with imuran or azathioprine monotherapy. She's had no surgeries to date. Um, she actually had a, uh, then had a spontaneous uh, pregnancy three months after the visit where she was declaring that she was having difficulty. Maybe her husband and her were in town at the same time. Um, so through a pregnancy, she had regular follow-ups with her perinatologist. Uh, she actually needed some progesterone supplementation during early pregnancy. She continued her infliximab and her azathioprine, 150 PO daily. She required induction uh, at 41 weeks not because of her IBD, but just because she, the baby was big and she went one week late, and usually that happens on first pregnancy. Um, she did have a delivery complicated by hem hemorrhaging, uh, requiring dilation and uh, curatage, and post-delivery did not try to nurse, which we see a lot, so this is a good time to talk about it, is she did not try to nurse due to concerns of exposure of the baby during breastfeeding, um, to both the biologic and the immunomodulator. So I think the case really sets the stage for all the elements that happens when uh, we have our preconception um, planning. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so in talking about pregnancy and IBD, this is an especially important topic because the incidence of Crohn's disease in women has been increasing. The diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis is often made in the childbearing years. And fertility and pregnancy need to be addressed by gastroenterologists, um, as well as OBs, as well as, as primary care physicians. So looking at fertility, fertility rates for women with ulcerative colitis are the same as that of the normal population. Women who have undergone ileal pouch anal anastomosis, or IPAA, for ulcerative colitis have decreased fecundity due to extensive pelvic adhesions that sometimes impair normal tubal functions. Women with IBD, unfortunately, have a high, higher rates of voluntary childlessness, and active inflammation seems to de or does decrease fertility. In men, sulfasalazine therapy reduces sperm motility and sperm count. So preconception counseling of the IBD patients is especially important. IBD patients often have incorrect beliefs and insufficient knowledge regarding IBD treatment during pregnancy and lactation. And studies have shown that preconception care is associated with adherence to IBD medication during pregnancy, adequate folic acid intake, smoking cessation, 
reduce disease relapse during pregnancy. This is independent of parity, disease duration, or activity before conception, and less likelihood of delivering babies of low birth weight. So the effect of IBD on pregnancy. So women with inactive IBD are at actually at no greater risk for spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, infant, stillbirth or infants with congenital abnormalities. Presence of active disease, however, does increase risk for premature birth. And women with Crohn's disease may be at a higher risk for low birth weight infants. In looking at the mother, there is no increased risk of gestational hypertension or proteinuria in the pregnant mom. Active perianal disease may worsen after vaginal de delivery, especially if they required episiotomy. And presence of IBD should actually not influence the mode of the delivery that's chosen. So effect of pregnancy on IBD. Active disease at the time of conception is associated with continued or worsening disease activity in approximately 70% of women. Quiescent UC at the time of conception is associated with roughly the same rate of relapse in the pregnant versus the non-pregnant woman. And there is some data that shows that disparity between mother and fetus in specific HLA alleles actually leads to downregulation of the mother's innate immune system, and thus clinical improvement is experienced during pregnancy. Women that have been pregnant have had fewer resections and longer intervals between resection compared to the nulliparous women. So how do you monitor disease course during pregnancy? Um, you have to be mindful of the fact that there's some laboratory markers that are off. So pregnant women will have increased ESRs, decreased albumins, and decreased hemoglobins. And in general, the guidelines recommend that clinical symptoms are more reliable for disease assessment than any of the lab parameters. Imaging-wise, ultrasound is safe, and MRI is preferred to CT imaging. There is no evidence that suggests that flex sig will induce premature labor, and colonoscopy should be reserved only to ascertain extent and severity of the disease. Indications for surgery are identical to those as the non-pregnant woman. The pregnant woman does not have more complications from stoma formation, and non-emergent surgery should actually be, it's best done in the second trimester if it can be. So looking at treatment of IBD during pregnancy, the goal is to really establish remission before conception and maintain it successfully during the pregnancy. Antibiotics such as ampicillin, cephalosporin, and erythromycin are deemed safe during pregnancy. And meta-analysis of first trimester quinolone exposure did not detect increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, and it is actually compatible with breastfeeding. Uh, met metronidazole is avoided in the first trimester because of risks of orofacial clefts, and it's actually incompatible with breastfeeding. Looking at your anti-inflammatory options, sulfazalazine crosses the placenta, but has not, there has not been any reported fetal abnormalities. You remind patients to take their folic acid to prevent neural tube defects, and this is prior to conception. Misalamine and topical 5 ASA agents are safe during pregnancy, and corticosteroids are not teratogenic. Prednisone does cross the placenta less, less efficiently and is actually recommended over bedesonide in the pregnant patient. So immunomodulators, 6-MP, azathioprine, and cyclosporin can be used if the mother's health mandates therapy with these agents. And methotrexate is obviously category X, so it's contraindicated. Biologic therapy, so infliximab was the first biologic approved for Crohn's disease, it's category B, not associated with an increased risk of congenital abnormalities or infections in the newborn, and it does cross the placenta, but it does in the third trimester. Adalimumab can also cross the placenta in the third trimester, and sertolizumab crosses the placenta in the first trimester at very small levels. The safety of natalizumab in, in uh, IBD is unknown, or in the, pregnant, in the pregnant woman with IBD is unknown. So it's important to treat an IBD flare in the mother. That's sort of the bottom line. Um, you try to avoid changing effective drugs to de that, you know, otherwise just with the aim of preventing placental transfer. In fliximab, the last dose is recommended at 32 weeks gestation. Discontinuing late in the second or early in the third trimester reduces transport across the placenta and lowers levels of serum and fliximab in the newborn. Adalimumab, the last dose, is at 36 to 38 weeks gestation, and dosing, dosing every other week may lead to flares if stopped earlier. Sertolizumab is continued through the pregnancy, and no live virus vaccination, including rotavirus, is recommended for the first six months for infants exposed to any biologic except sertolizumab. So, 
sort of to sum it up, it's uh, care of the pregnant IVD lady is an interdisciplinary team approach. The GI, the obstetrician, and the pediatrician have to be really involved. They have to communicate with each other. The GI manages the IVD, communicates with the high-risk OB and the pediatrician. The mode of delivery, like we had alluded to earlier, is a discussion between the OB and the patient, of course, being mindful of active perianal disease or an existing J pouch. And especially important for the pediatrician to remember is that no live virus vaccine for the first six months, including rotavirus. Thank you.